All right, I guess we'll get started. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Brenda Hunda. I'm the curator of invertebrate paleontology at the Cincinnati Museum Center. And I'm really um, happy to be here today to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects in the world, the Cincinnatian series and the Ordovician of Cincinnati. Uh, today, we're gonna go through just a general um, overview of the Cincinnatian and the rocks that we have in this area. I think many of you are probably very familiar if you've lived here uh, for any length of time and been out in the creeks or seen the road cuts, that we have quite a suite of beautiful rocks um, in this area and these rocks are, are really super significant. So we're going to talk a little bit about what these rocks mean and how they came to be here in Cincinnati, why we have them and what they can tell us about the history of um, our planet. And so I'm going to go right into sharing my screen. And let's see. Can everybody see that okay? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great, thank you. Just let me know if there's any problems. I'm a paleontologist, not a technophile, so I <laughs> have to get used to all these things. So Cincinnati actually is pretty world famous for its fossils and long, long ago, 450 million years ago, we used to have an ocean that covered most of the United States, indeed actually most of North America. And if you, if you ever go around our creek beds or into our local parks or happen to stop along the side of the road and look at a road cut, you'll see and you'll know that there are tons and tons of different types of fossil shells preserved in the rocks around here. I think most people think that this is a fairly normal thing, particularly if you've grown up in this area, but actually this is really a, a, a very unique situation that we have here in Cincinnati. Um, it's very special to us. There are a few other places I can think of in North America um, that have quite the density of fossil preservation and specimens that we have here just by picking up a single rock um, in this area. So let's start off really by giving a bit of background um, to our subject area today, and that is the study of paleontology. Uh, when think of, people think of paleontology, they think of dinosaurs. They're sort of the media darling of the paleontology world. Um, indeed, dinosaurs are totally awesome. I grew up on dinosaurs like most kids uh, probably do as sort of their gateway into paleontology and the sciences in general. Um, but really, paleontology dinosaurs are only a small portion of the total history of life that we have as reflected in the fossil record. So while they are super cool, um, we have about three and a half billion years worth of body fossils to study um, in, uh, in our rocks on Earth. And, uh, and life does go beyond that. We have chemical fossils that indicate that life may have been around as early as 3.8 billion years. Um, and that's a really long time. So life was pretty much on this planet uh, the moment that it was suitable for life very early in our history. Uh, paleontology really deals with animals and plants and other organisms. We tend to leave humans to uh, the anthropologists and human culture to the archaeologists, although we do cross um, in paleoanthropology. But otherwise, paleontologists are pretty much responsible for everything else that ever existed on the planet. Uh, you can imagine that that's a lot of really awesome things to study. Uh, like I said before, vertebrate paleontology, the dinosaurs and other animals with backbones um, tend to be what people think of mainly when they think of uh, paleontology. Um, but there are a lot of other areas of paleontology to study. Uh, here in the Cincinnatian, um, we are lucky in that most of you are probably familiar with invertebrate paleontology, maybe more so than a lot of people. Um, and these are the animals without backbones. So they are the animals that I uh, tend to think of that either crunch or squish when you step on them. And so in the Cincinnati, and we're really dealing uh, mostly with uh, invertebrates, things like trilobites, corals, brachiopods, snails, uh, crinoids, clams, and so forth. And we'll talk a little bit more about those guys a little later. Uh, there's also the study of micropaleontology. Uh, this is the suite of, of uh, creatures, whether it's phyto or zooplankton, things that are very small that, um, that uh, usually are in our marine record. And then also paleobotany, another love of mine actually. 
the study of the fossil plants, uh, which of course are very important for informing us about the evolution of our climate and life um, on Earth. So growing up in the Cincinnati area or going out, you see that there's a ton of fossil shells preserved in our rocks. And you may think that becoming a fossil is actually quite a common occurrence, but really only a very small proportion of the total life on Earth that we've had um, are preserved as fossils. So fossils really are the remains or traces of organisms that lived um, in the past that are preserved in our crust. And there are about five general stages of uh, what it takes to become a fossil. Um, first, you kind of have to die. That's the bad news. Uh, <laughs> and dying can actually happen either before or during the process of deposition. So rapid burial by sediments, mud, sands, these kinds of things um, is an important component of becoming a fossil. Uh, you need to have rapid burial in order to be um, protected, if you will, your body to be protected from uh, various different things like wave action at the bottom of the sea floor or scavenging by other animals that may serve to uh, tear you apart, disassociate you, disarticulate you, and so forth. All those lovely things uh, post-mortem. Um, as sediments accumulate um, over time, they add uh, pressure and increased temperature or heat, potentially compression, weight, to um, the sediments and that helps to induce a whole lot of uh, physical and chemical changes that act to uh, preserve you in a variety of different manners. There are many ways that as a fossil organism you can be preserved. Um, and so over time those chemical and physical changes will uh, transform an organism into a fossil. And then the key is to find it. And the way to do that is through uplift. So those layers have to be somehow uh, presented to the surface, either through uplift or cutting down, uh, oftentimes like in river sediments and so forth, uh, to expose it. And then erosion will then come in, wash, uh, weather away those rocks and expose the um, specimens, the fossils, to us being able to see them, collect them, study them, and so forth. So it's really not very easy to become a fossil. There's a lot of very different things that need to happen. Um, so out of the billions of animals and plants and organisms we've had uh, throughout geologic time, our fossil record um, is a small but significant proportion of all life on Earth. And you can imagine that really the best things that fossilize are going to be the hard parts of animals and plants. Um, things like shells and teeth and bones and so forth. Uh, but we do have exceptional sites of preservation and different types of preservation that can preserve um, soft, uh, soft parts as well. So it used to be that collecting fossils was kind of like the cool thing to do to kind of see who could get, um, you know, the best or biggest example of something like a dinosaur or another, another um, animal. And really, at, at that point, it was really about just collecting the fossil diversity that we have on our planet, sharing that. It really is the basis. Collecting is the basis for everything that we sort of know in the biological and paleontological sciences. So it's really a very important part, and we still do it an awful lot. That's how we describe new species and make new discoveries. But as we've amassed the bank of knowledge, like the number of specimens and species that we know about, their occurrences, both geographically and in time, these big ancient libraries have afforded paleontologists and other scientists opportunities to study really major, major questions about life and the history of life on our planet. And so we can look at things like major evolutionary relationships. How were things related to each other? And of course, this informs the modern flora and fauna as well. Um, we can look at the evolution of communities and community structure and how those change through time. What does it take to become a coral reef or a rainforest and, and how do those um, interactions in those communities play out under different conditions like climate change? How do taxa work together? How do we have structural hierarchies in terms of food webs and niches? Um, and in the case of community collapse, how, uh, particularly during biotic crises, how do, how do these communities 
reorganize, who goes extinct and why. There's a whole lot of questions about how communities evolve. Also, we can study bigger questions like biodiversity through time. How does biodiversity in the marine and on land change in response to evolutionary radiations? That's when we have a, a evolution of, of um, rapid evolution of species. Um, and how does it respond to drops in species like during mass extinction events? And how do, what are the factors that cause those and change those? Of course, the distribution of fossils on Earth during different times tells us a lot about how plate tectonics operates, tells us about how plates were together or apart, their position in the past. Um, classic example, of course, is Pangaea. We know an awful lot about that because of the distribution of fossils. And environmental change. This is really an important component for us, particularly in these days, because the Earth has run a lot of experiments in its past in relation to climate change, some way more extreme, some less so um, relative to what we're seeing today. And the response of animals and communities to those environmental changes can help us understand what the long-term consequences of these climate impacts might be on various ecosystems, communities, and organisms. And of course, because we have this global library of knowledge now, uh, we can look at these changes over multiple scales, whether we're looking at it in Cincinnati region, whether we're looking at it in North America as a whole, or maybe in the world as a whole. So many of you are very familiar with this view um, going uh, south on I-75, and you'll see on your right-hand side the big, what's known as the cut in the hail. It's kind of the famous entrance point to Cincinnati when you're coming in uh, north on the I-75. I'm sure many of you have seen that, uh, maybe had a, a nice long look at it during a traffic accident or a um, traffic snarl. And, and these rocks, as we see in cuts around the Cincinnati area, whether 75 or 275 otherwise, are actually really important rocks uh, to geologists and, and scientists, and paleontologists specifically, um, because they tell us an awful lot about a very specific interval in Earth's history. Our rocks are really important around here. Um, they're known as the North American Upper Ordovician Type Standard, which basically means for North America, if you want to study the interval of geologic time between 451 to 444 million years ago, in the United States, in North America, excuse me, um, we are the flagship area, the best area, what we call the type area for understanding the record during this time. Um, and it's no surprise that's the case because of the beautiful outcrops and extensive outcropping we have in this region. So much so that our rocks for this time interval, um, no matter where you go in North America, are named after us. So the rocks that you see at the cut in the hill and around here are known as the Cincinnatian series. And indeed, many of the ways that geologists break up the record into formations and members, these units, are named after places that they were first described in this region, like the Coryville, um, like Blanchester or Clarksville or Liberty the Whitewater, um, and Waynesville, and so forth. So these units are actually named after areas of this region. In order to really understand what we're talking about here with this ancient ocean about 450 million years ago, we kind of need to go a little bit back in time um, and take a look at what the Earth looked like back then. And of course, thanks to plate tectonics, we all know that um, oceans and, and continental configurations shift through time. And what we can see here with the red star, which is Cincinnati, is that we were actually in the Southern Hemisphere, about 20 degrees south of the equator. And most of our continent was under a shallow, warm, tropical ocean, which is represented by that lighter blue color there. Um, North America, as we know, it was not fully formed. Continents have to, have to for lack of a better word, grow. Um, and, uh, and as continental plates come together and move apart, they separate pieces, they pick up pieces um, to make what is our modern continents today. And uh, North America didn't really have a Eastern or Western seaboard at this time. So our proto-North American continent is known as Laurentia. And uh, some of our neighbors are a little bit different than they are today. Uh, you can see in the Northern Hemisphere, our closest neighbor is Siberia. 
And um, in the Southern Hemisphere, our closest neighbor is Baltica. So this is uh, the Baltic states, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and so forth, and parts of Northern Europe, which will actually collide with us um, a little bit later on Slero Devonian um, to form the Caledonian mountain range. You can also see that we have a major continent uh, to the right, Gondwana, which is a, a common theme that we see in, in um, the history of Earth. Gondwana is a continent that's made up of mostly the A's, as I, as I like to call it, Antarctica, Australia, Africa, South America, a um, little bit of uh, some Madagascar, some India in there, some China, um, but it's mostly the major A continents that tend to stay uh, predominantly in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and also you'll see at the bottom left, there's New England and Nova Scotia uh, down there. That, that terrain will eventually come up and collide with us on the eastern margin of Laurentia to start forming our modern uh, continent as we know it. These collisions um, happen frequently throughout geologic history. And really the first of these uh, on the eastern seaboard, there are uh, three. Is going, to be, is going to happen about 470 million years ago in the Ordovician time period when a volcanic island arc system moved onto and collided with the eastern margin of Laurentia. Um, this created a highland area pretty much exactly in the area that we know of as the Appalachian Mountains today. The Appalachian Mountains are a, the formation of the result of three separate collisions. So you can think of these as kind of the basement or the beginning of the formation of the Appalachian Mountain Range. And we tend to think of it in the, like the modern example that we have with, um, with the Himalayas pictured above here, where India has collided with Eurasia to form the Himalayan mountain range. Really what's happened here tectonically is that that volcanic island arc system has been pushed onto and into the edge of North America or Laurentia as ocean crust, the ocean beneath it was being eaten and subducted uh, into the interior of the earth. Uh, when we have continental, continental collisions or pieces of continent collide with each other, uh, we do make mountain ranges. Um, and so that explains mountains like the Rockies, it explains the Appalachians um, and the Himalayas today, amongst many others. So at about 450 million years ago, we had a, a fully fledged sort of taconic mountain range on the east coast of North America. The star there once again denotes uh, where we are. And you can see coming up next was, is the second collision that is going to be um, Avalonia, uh, Baltica, that is going to actually give us a, uh, a two-part collision um, that's gonna continue to merge and grow the eastern margin of North America. Um, these taconic highlands that we had to the east were pretty much bare. At this time, there really was no life on land. Uh, we have some evidence that there may have been early plants like liverworts um, and mosses skirting shorelines, but as far as full terrestrialization, there's no evidence in the record that that has happened yet. That comes a little bit later. And so these rocks are really um, open and exposed to weathering processes. So the rocks would have been eroded and shedding um, into our region at much faster rates than what, sort of what we're used to seeing today. And as um, a function of actually being in the Southern Hemisphere in order near the equator at this time, we would have had very large storms like hurricanes, uh, much bigger maybe than even what we see today, coming through this region down to the southern, uh, past south of the equator, not near the equator, but south of the equator into this area here and really stirring up sediments, all those sediments that are shedding off of the mountains and bringing them down into our very shallow ocean that we have at this time. These storm waves um, produced uh, a, a mud, submarine mudslides that would take that mud and transport it down slope in these gravity flows called tempestites. Uh, tempestite, of course, uh, referring to tempestuous or stormy. These tempestites would travel downslope through gravity and basically bury anything that was alive on the seafloor that could not get out of the way. Or if it was a thick enough blanket of mud, bury anything alive that, that wouldn't be able to get out. Um, this is one of the, the uh, hallmarks of the Cincinnatian series because this rapid burial is what gives us our beautiful preservation that we see of organisms on the seafloor. 
At the same time, these wave actions at the top here would have winnowed away that mud and concentrated shelly debris at the bottom of the seafloor to create limestones. So you can kind of think of our limestone benches that we have in the Cincinnati and as homegrown. They formed here as a response to wave actions accumulating shelly debris on the bottom of the seafloor. And our muds, our shales, basically coming in from the Taconics about 300 miles away from us, being brought in by these storm waves and these um, submarine mud flows. These things don't necessarily happen random. There is a pattern that geologists can uh, determine based on what sea level conditions are doing at this time and what climate is doing at this time. So here's the Maysville cut out near Maysville, Kentucky. It's a, an amazing cut of about 2 million years of geologic time. And you can see that there's a pattern. There's shales, banks of limestones, shales, banks of limestones, and so forth. This cyclicity is really important for scientists to understand both the sea level changes that are happening in this area, as well as the climate cycles that are happening in this area. And because we can see different types of depositional environments, it also helps us to understand the different species or taxa that are occurring in these various environments and the environmental conditions upon which they're living and also that they're being deposited in. Let's get to the fossils. Cincinnati fossils are incredibly famous for their excellent preservation thanks to these mudslides um, and early cementation that we have in the rocks around here. And in fact, many, many of these, I think, can uh, be stuck in an aquarium today and it feels like they should just pop out legs, open up valves and start doing their business. Uh, and so uh, this beautiful three-dimensional uh, preservation, as well as the high degree of articulation that we can find in these fossils, particularly in the muds, um, the limestones are a little bit different, really speak to the fact that we had rapid, rapid burial and um, early cementation in our local rocks. And there's a whole variety. So one of the other hallmarks of the Cincinnatian is really the massive diversity of different types of animals that we have here. Anything from, of course, trilobites, which are one of my favorites, of course, snails, starfish and crinoids, uh, edrioasteroids, which are these really unique and interesting um, echinoderms, one of the, which is the official city of Cincinnati fossil, Isorophus cincinnatiensis, um, clams, all kinds of creatures, the corals, the diversity in the Cincinnatian is astounding. And if we were able to recreate what the Cincinnatian Sea would look like, we could uh, take a look at this picture painted by John Agnew of the Cincinnatian Ocean. You'll note that uh, it, looks, it looks somewhat kind of similar to what we might expect in a modern ocean today. There's a lot of creatures that, like these big cephalopods and these crinoids that are, are a little weird to see, but, but you recognize this as a cephalopod. It's basically a giant um, externally shelled uh, squid uh, and uh, trilobites we don't have around today anymore, but we have other arthropod representatives like crabs and lobsters and fun things like that. We still have clams around and snails. We still have corals and so forth, as you can see here. But you'll also note that we're missing a, ma a major component of the marine world today, which is the vertebrates. So namely fish and um, Fish, early fish had evolved at this point, but we don't find their remains around here yet. Um, we don't know why that's the case. Uh, at this time in Earth's history, we're, looking, we're thinking about really er, early jawless fish, uh, but we don't find their remains around here. Uh, it could be because they weren't here yet. It could, there was, maybe there was some burial to, um, barrier to dispersal. Maybe the preservational conditions weren't right. Maybe we just haven't recognized them yet. Uh, that's, a, that's a challenge for anybody who can find uh, Cincinnati and fish. That's a definite uh, hot scientific paper. So I would challenge you to go ahead and do that. All right. Um, I think that I am going to leave it there for now and stop sharing my screen and go to any questions that anybody might have about the Cincinnati and Sea.
we can definitely go more into uh, how the rocks, um, you know, arrive at the surface here through plate tectonic action. Anybody have any favorite fossils that they love to find or want to know how to find them and where to get them? I can help you with that. Um, Linda, can you tell us how extensive these Cincinnatian rocks are uh, geographically? Sure. So I think if you thought of them as the center of a bullseye, um, you could find them all the way from Dayton, Ohio, down to Lexington, Kentucky, and then uh, maybe a similar diameter out east and west towards Indianapolis and, um, gosh, I don't know, Adams County. Is that related to their area of deposition or is that only their current exposure? Right, so that's their current exposure. So uh, the uh, Cincinnati and Ordovician rocks actually have like a dome called the Cincinnati Arch. And we're sitting right set, sort of in the smack of it where they're exposed here, but they do dive down into the subsurface. So those uh, deposits would have been much more extensive across North America than we see them physically in this area. And indeed they do outcrop in other places. And the controls on that of where they outcrop and where they, um, where you can't see them at the surface are related to the tectonic history of our continent, as well as the erosional history of our continent. Okay, hey, Brenda, can you uh, tell us a little bit about the difference in preservation between uh, the, the shales and these massive limestones? What would one expect differently? Sure, so let me see if I can go into my, I don't know if I have any, I don't have any pictures of that here. So I'll just tell you. So because the shales, uh, technically known as mud, like technical term is mudstones, um, uh, ha are the result of rapid burial, what we expect to find in those particular deposits are gonna be specimens that are uh, much better preserved. Usually what you'll find is um, specimens that are articulated, they have all their pieces together. Um, they are sometimes inflated and three dimensional in part because we have early cementation in the rocks. That means they get hard really early, so they encase uh, the specimens before they get compacted. And so we see these beautiful, beautiful three-dimensional fossils. In the shales, you're gonna find fewer of those. Uh, while the preservation is better, the abundance is a lot less, just because you are preserving basically kind of a snapshot of what's on the seafloor at that time. In contrast, the limestones are an accumulation of fossils. They're where the waves have come in and they've touched the bottom of the ocean and they've sort of taken the mud out and anything that's accumulated, either, either remains that were already there and disarticulated or fresh remains from um, animals that have died during that process will have accumulated over time. And so because of that wave action, you'd expect to see the fossils being disarticulated, broken up, you see a lot more pieces of them as opposed to whole individuals. Depending on how thick a limestone is and how many times it's kind of undergone this process, you can find limestones with uh, pieces that are together and full versus to limestones that are just like you can't recognize, um, you know, fossil debris without looking at it under a microscope. It just gets completely obliterated. Uh, the other key thing about limestones is because it is an accumulation, sometimes over the course of thousands of years, uh, you're going to get a lot more fossil debris in there and you're also going to see a lot more representations of different types of animals than you would see in a single mudstone layer um, because of the accumulation. And interestingly, you'll also find a lot more rare taxa in limestones than you would see in mudstones because it is an accumulation and those rare representatives will pop in there a lot more frequently. Thank you. Yeah. Brenda, could you tell us bit about the like trace fossils that we might be able to find in the area. Obviously we kind of emphasized true form and animal fossils, but what kind of trace fossils would be associated with these computers? Yeah, so let me um, actually go in and share my screen for a second just to show you a quick picture of um, uh, some trace fossils. Do I have any here? Yeah. I despite my my, um, sorry guys, let me get back there. There we go, there's one right there. Despite the fact that I focus on body fossils today, trace fossils are a love of mine as well. 
Um, any part of a marine community or any community for that matter has a large component of soft bodied organisms and soft bodied organisms don't preserve very well. Some do if they have little hard parts like worms can have jaws and stuff, but otherwise uh, we don't really see the worms themselves, but we all, but we do see their records of behavior and trace fossils are uh, uh, fossils that record behavior rather than the body fossils themselves. And we can think of a dinosaur footprint as a classic example of one of those. Um, indeed, in Cincinnati, and we don't have dinosaurs, we're 250 million years too old for that, but we do have the remain, the be fossil behavior of worms and arthropods screwing around the sea floor. This one here that's on my screen that I'm pointing to is a diplocriterion. and it's actually a worm burrow. And you can find a whole suite of burrowing and movement activities preserved in a type of rock that I have not specifically addressed here called the Kelsey siltites. They're a third type that we have in the Cincinnatian that um, are basically silt, uh, that, um, so finer grain than a sand, and they do an excellent job of preserving um, these, these silts. And what the trace fossils tell us that's really important is that we have a vibrant, uh, soft-bodied community of worms and other animals moving around, feeding, uh, delving into the substrate. So there's a good benthic fauna. We also can tell because of this vibrancy that the bottom of the ocean was oxygenated, um, which isn't a given in the history of our planet. Many times we've had a, an anoxic or low oxygen bottom environment. And so that's how we can see these representatives. Now, if you go out in the field and start to recognize some of these, you'll see them absolutely everywhere. And so they're a very important component of our, of our marine ecosystem here in the Cincinnatian. Has our downy come back yet? Anybody seen the downy yet? Not since earlier. Aren't there, um, I'm sorry, I, I missed that. Like, Someone's cutting out. Uh, are there similar fossils to like Uzophytus for trilobites that other organisms would create? I'm sorry. Um, we're kind of a little, my internet connection is a little unstable. We were talking about Rhizophycus. Yeah, I was wondering if any other organism in the Ordovician would have a similar trace fossil. Um, I mean, we do see other examples of arthropods that are, that do, um, uh, you know, those kind of burrowing types of examples. Um, Limulus is an example that we do see, another arthropod. Um, I'm not super familiar with the trace fossils of the decapods, like the crustaceans and so forth. Um, we do know that a lot of them do make in-place or in-house burrows as well, like uh, Ophiomorpha and stuff like that. Later on, we don't see that in the Cincinnati. And we also know that arthropods make a whole lot of other kinds of traces besides Rhizophycus. You can see them uh, cruising along the sea floor, which uh, we find in Cruziana. And oftentimes they'll lift up and they will use their endopodites and kind of scurry along the sea floor. And you see just little tiny scratches, it's diplocnites. Um, yeah, so there's a whole host of different types of uh, burrows and other um, uh, marks that they make. The thing about trace fossils is that um, any individual can make many different types of traces depending on whether they're feeding, walking, running, burrowing, but also many different types of individuals make the same type of trace depending on, on um, what they're doing. And so it can be often di difficult at times to identify the trace maker with the trace. Uh, we have a couple of, of advantages in the Cincinnati and we have found the trace maker actually with the trace fossil several times so we know who was making it and also we can use the modern record to help us understand what kinds of animals might be making traces. I know there's a, a big sea scorpion in the Cincinnati and I'm guessing you've never seen any traces of that right in trace fossils. Not that we've been able to recognize but I have a whole, whole, a whole cabinet of potential trace fossils that no one has ascribed to anything yet. Um, this is, uh, Gwen's referring to Megalograptus, our big um, Ordovician Eurypterid sea scorpion. He's one of our famous um, players in the area. Uh, they could get up to four feet in length, and they were also one of the major predators that we had in the ocean. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you um, that we will have an Ordovician exhibit uh, coming to the museum center. Um, in the next little while. We are working uh, crazily on it right now. And we're very excited to be able to bring it. 
to everybody. The, the Ordovician exhibit is uniquely a Cincinnatian thing. I mean, we can do it better than anybody can. And our lovely Megalograptus will be prominently featured in that exhibit amongst many other amazing fossils that you can find in the Cincinnati area. Well, if anybody doesn't have any further questions, I really would like to thank you for your time in attending today. I'm sure that we'll have an occasion to talk more about the Cincinnatian as there's a whole lot more to discuss. This was just our primer for today. Um, you know, we are, our facility, our museum center is currently closed and we are reaching out um, as much as we can to our community to let you know that we are still here. We're still excited about what we do. We're still very active. Um, if you would like to support us in any kind of way, we'd certainly appreciate it, either by renewing your memberships or signing up for a membership, also by donating to our organization. You can find all the avenues to be able to do this online at www.cincymuseum.org. We appreciate your support. Um, um, and please come back and visit us again for another uh, YMCA curator talk. Have a great day, everybody.